And to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street by Dr. Seuss. When I leave home to walk to school, Dad always says to me, Marco, keep your eyelids up and see what you can see. But when I tell him where I've been and what I think I've seen, he looks at me and sternly says, Your eyesight's much too keen. Stop telling such outlandish tales. Stop turning minnows into whales. Now what can I say when I get home today? All the long way to school and all the way back, I've looked and I've looked and I've kept careful track. But all that I've noticed, except my own feet, was a horse and a wagon on Mulberry Street. That's nothing to tell of. That won't do, of course. Just a broken down wagon that's drawn by a horse. That can't be my story. That's only a start. I'll say that a zebra was pulling that cart. And that is a story that no one can beat when I say that I saw it on Mulberry Street. Yes, the zebra is fine. But I think it's a shame, such a marvelous beast with a cart that's so tame. The story would really be better to hear if the driver I saw were a charioteer. A golden blue chariot something to meet, rumbling like thunder down Mulberry Street. No, it won't do at all. A zebra's too small. A reindeer is better. He's fast and he's fleet. And he'd look mighty smart on old Mulberry Street. Hold on a minute, there's something wrong. A reindeer hates the way it feels to pull a thing that runs on wheels. He'd be much happier instead if he could pull a fancy sled. Hmm, a reindeer and sleigh. Say, anyone could think of that. Jack or Fred or Joe or Nat. Say, even Jane could think of that. But it isn't too late to make one little change. A sleigh and an elephant. There's something strange. I'll pick one with plenty of power and size, a blue one with plenty of fun in his eyes, and then, just to give him a little more tone, have a rajah with rubies perched high on a throne. Say, that makes a story that no one can beat when I say that I saw it on Mulberry Street. But now I don't know. It still doesn't seem right. An elephant pulling a thing that's so light would whip it around in the air like a kite. But he looks simply grand with a great big brass band. A band that's so good should have someone to hear it, but it's going so fast that it's hard to keep near it. I'll put on a trailer. I know they won't mind if a man sits and listens while hitched on behind. But now is it fair? Is it fair what I've done? I'll bet those wagons weigh more than a ton. It's really too heavy a load for one beast. I'll give him some helpers. He needs two at least. But now what worries me is this. Mulberry Street runs into bliss. Unless there's something I can fix up, there'll be an awful traffic mix-up. It takes police to do the trick, to guide them through where traffic's thick. It takes police to do the trick. They'll never crash now. They'll race at top speed, with Sergeant Mulvaney himself in the lead. The mayor is there, and he thinks it is grand, and he raises his hat as they dash by the stand. The mayor is there, and the aldermen too, all waving big banners of red, white, and blue. And that is a story that no one can beat when I say that I saw it on Mulberry Street. With the roar of its motor, an airplane appears and dumps out confetti while everyone cheers. And that makes a story that's really not bad, but it still could be better. Suppose that I add... A Chinese man who eats with sticks, a big magician doing tricks, a ten-foot beard that needs a comb. No time for more, I'm almost home. I swung round the corner and dashed through the gate. I ran up the steps and I felt simply great, for I had a story that no one could beat, and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. But Dad said quite calmly, just draw up your stool and tell me the sights on the way home from school. There was so much to tell, I just couldn't begin. Dad looked at me sharply and pulled at his chin. He frowned at me sternly from there in his seat. Was there nothing to look at? No people to greet? 
Did nothing excite you or make your heart beat? Nothing, I said, growing red as a beet, but a plain horse and wagon on Mulberry Street. McElligot's Pool by Dr. Seuss Young man, laughed the farmer, you're sort of a fool. You'll never catch fish in McElligot's Pool. The pool is too small, and you might as well know it. When people have junk, here's the place that they throw it. You might catch a boot, or you might catch a can. You might catch a bottle, but listen, young man. If you sat fifty years with your worms and your wishes, you'd grow a long beard long before you'd catch fishes. Hmm, answered Marco. It may be that you're right. I've been here three hours without one single bite. There might be no fish. But again, well, there might. Because you never can tell what goes on down below. This pool might be bigger than you or I know. This might be a pool like I've read of in books, connected to one of those underground brooks. An underground river that starts here and flows right under the pasture, and then, well, who knows? It might go along down where no one can see, right under State Highway 203. Right under the wagons, right under the toes of Mrs. Umbroso who's hanging out clothes. It might keep on flowing, perhaps, who can tell, right under the people in Sneedon's hotel. Right under the grass where they're playing croquet, then under the mountains and far, far away. This might be a river, now mightn't it be, connecting McElligot's pool with the sea. Then maybe some fish might be swimming toward me. If such a thing could be, they certainly would be. Some very smart fellow might point out the way to the place where I'm fishing. And that's why I say, if I wait long enough, if I'm patient and cool, who knows what I'll catch in McElligot's pool. I might catch a thin fish. I might catch a stout fish. I might catch a short or a long, long, drawn-out fish. Any kind, any shape, any color or size. I might catch some fish that would open your eyes. I won't be surprised if a dogfish appears, complete with a collar and long floppy ears, woofing along, and perhaps he might chase a whole lot of catfish right straight to this place. I might catch a fish with a pinwheel-like tail. I might catch a fish who has fins like a sail. I might catch some young fish, some high-jumping friskers. I might catch an old one with long flowing whiskers. I might catch a fish with a long curling nose. I might catch a fish like a rooster that crows. I might catch a fish with a checkerboard belly. Or even a fish made of strawberry jelly. I might catch a seahorse, now mightn't I now? I might catch a fish who is partly a cow. Some fish from the tropics, all sunburned and hot, might decide to swim up. Well, they might, might they not? Racing up north for a chance to get cool. Full steam ahead for McGillagot's pool. Some Eskimo fish from beyond Hudson Bay might decide to swim down, might be headed this way. It's a pretty long trip, but they might, and they may. I might catch an eel. Well, I might, it depends. A long, twisting eel with a lot of strange bends. And oddly enough, with a head on both ends. One doesn't catch this kind of fish as a rule, but the chances are fine in McGillagot's pool. I might catch a fish with a terrible grouch, or an Australian fish with a kangaroo pouch. Who wants to catch small ones like mackerel or trout? Say, I'll catch a sawfish with such a long snout that he needs an assistant to help him about.
If I wait long enough, if I'm patient and cool, who knows what I'll catch in McGillagot's pool. Some roughneck old lobster, all gristle and muscle, might grab at my bait. Then would I have a tussle. To land one so tough might take two or three hours, but the next might be easy. The kind that likes flowers. I might catch some sort of a fast-moving bloke who zips through the waves with an overarm stroke. I might, and I may, and that's really no joke. A fish even faster, a fish, if you please, who slides down the sides of strange islands on skis. He might ski on over and pay me a visit. That's not impossible, really, now is it? Some circus fish, fish from an acrobat school, might stage a big show in McGillagot's pool. Or I might catch a fish from a stranger place yet, from the world's highest river in far off Tibet, where the falls are so steep that it's dangerous to ride them, so the fish put up shoots and they float down beside them. From the world's deepest ocean, from way down below, from down in the mud where the deep divers go, from down in the mire and the muck and the murk, I might catch some fish who are all going glurk. Whales! I'll catch whales! Yes, a whole herd of whales! All spouting their spouts and all thrashing their tails. I'll catch fifty whales! Then I'll stop for the day, cause there's nothing that's bigger than whales, so they say. Still, of course, it might be... That there is something bigger, some sort of a kind of a thingamajigger. A fish that's so big, if you know what I mean, that he makes a whale look like a tiny sardine. Oh, the sea is so full of a number of fish, if a fellow is patient, he might get his wish. And that's why I think I'm not such a fool when I sit here and fish in McGillagot's pool. So if I ran the zoo. It's a pretty good zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, and the fellow who runs it seems proud of it too. But if I ran the zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, I'd make a few changes. That's just what I'd do. The lions and tigers and that kind of stuff they have up here are not quite good enough. You see things like these in just any old zoo. They're awfully old-fashioned. I want something new. So I'd open each cage, I'd unlock every pen, let the animals go and start over again. And somehow or other, I think I could find some beasts of a much more unusual kind. The four-footed lion's not much of a beast. The one in my zoo will have ten feet at least. Five legs on the left and five more on the right. Then people will stare and they'll say, what a sight. This zookeeper, new keeper, Gerald's quite keen. That gold darndest lion I ever have seen. My new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will make people talk. My new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will make people gawk at the strangest odd creatures that ever did walk. I'll get for my zoo a new sort of hen who roosts in another's hen's top knot, and then another one who roosts in the top knot of his, and another in his, and another in his, and so forth, and upward, and onward. Gee whiz! But that's just the start. I'll do better than that. They'll see me the next day in my zookeeper's hat, coming into my zoo with an elephant cat. They'll be so surprised they'll all swallow their gum. They'll ask when they see my strange animals come. Where do you suppose he gets things like that from? His animals all have such very odd faces. I'll bet he must hunt them in rather odd places.
and that's what I'll do, said young Gerald McGrew. If you want to catch beasts you don't see every day, you'll have to go place, places quite out of the way. You'll have to go to places no others can get to. You'll have to get cold, and you'll have to get wet, too. You have up past the North Pole, where the frozen winds squeal, I'll go and I'll hunt in my skeagle mobile and bring back a family of what do you know? And that's how my new zoo, McGrew Zoo, will grow. I'll hunt in the mountains of Zamba Matant with help helpers who all wear their eyes at a slant and capture a fine fluffy bird called the Bustard who only eats custard with sauce made of mustard. And also a very fine beast called the Flustered who only eats mustard with sauce made of custard. I'll catch him in caves, I'll catch him in brooks, I'll catch him in crannies, I'll catch him in nooks that you don't read about in geography books. I'll catch him in countries that no one can spell, like the country of Mata Fapata Fapel. In a country like that, if a hunter is clever, he'll hunt up some beasts that you never saw ever. I'll load up five boats with a family of jokes whose feet are like cows but wear squirrel skin coats and sit down like dogs but have voices like goats, excepting that they can't sing the very high notes. And then I'll go down to the wilds of Nantucket and capture a family of lunks in a bucket. Then people will say, now I like that boy heaps. His new zoo, McGrew zoo, is growing by leaps. He captures them wild and captures them meek. He captures them slim and he captures them sleek. What do you suppose he will capture next week? I'll capture one tiny, I'll capture one cute, I'll capture a deer that no one, no hunter would shoot. A deer that's so nice he could sleep in your bed if it weren't for those horns that he had on his head. And speaking of horns that are just a bit queer, I'll bring back a very odd family of deer. A father, a mother, two sisters, a brother, whose horns are connected from one to the other, whose horns are so mixed they can't tell them apart, can't tell where they end, and can't tell where they start. Each deer is mighty puzzled. He's never yet found if his horns are hers or the other way around. I'll capture them fat, I'll capture them scrawny, I'll capture a scragglefoot mulligatwani. A high-stepping animal fast as the wind from the blistering sands of the desert of Zind. This beast is the beast that the brave chieftains ride when they want to go fast to find some place to hide. A mulligatani is fine for my zoo. It is a chieftain, I'll bring back one too. In the far western part of southeast North Dakota lives a very fine animal called the iota. And I'll capture one who is even much finer in the northeastern west part of South Carolina. When people see him, they will say, now by thunder, this new zoo, McGrew Zoo, is really a wonder. Most beasts are quite friendly, but still in some lands, some beasts are too dangerous to catch with bare hands. For those who are ugly and vicious and mean, I'll build a bad animal catching machine. It's rather expensive to build such a kit, but with it, a hunter can never get bit. A zoo should have bugs, so I'll capture a Whirl, whose legs are snarled up in a terrible snarl. Then I'll go out and I'll capture some chugs, some keen shooter, mean shooter, bean shooter bugs. I 
I'll go to the African island of Yurka and bring back a tizzle-topped, tufted mazurka, a kind of canary with quite a tall throat. His neck is long, if he swallows an oat. For breakfast, the first day of April, they say, it has to go down such a very long way that it gets to his stomach the 15th of May. I'll bag a big bug who is very surprising, a feller who has a propeller for rising and zooming around making cross-country hops from Texas to Boston with only two stops. Now that sort of thing for a bug is just tops. And then I've caught, when I've caught him, then the next thing you know, I'll go and I'll capture a wild tic-tac-toe. With X's that win and with zeros that lose, he'll look mighty good in his zoo in this zoo of McGrews. I'll bring back a gusset, a gherkin, a gasket, and also a gooch from the wilds of Nantasket. And eight Persian princes will carry the basket, but what their names are, I don't know, so don't ask it. In a cave in, in Khartoum lives a beast called the Natch that no other hunters have been able to catch. He's hidden for years in his cave with a pout, and no one's been able to make him come out. But I'll coax him out with a wonderful meal that's cooked by my cooks and my cooker mobile. They'll fix up a dish that is just to his taste, three chicken croquette, croquettes made of library paste. And then sprinkled with peanut shucks, pickled and spiced, then baked at 600 degrees, and then iced. It's mighty hard cooking to cook up such feasts, but that's how the new zoo, McGrew Zoo, gets beasts. I'll go to the faraway mountains of Topsk, near the river of Nopsk, and I'll bring back an Opsk, a sort of kind of thing a mabopsk. Then people will flock to my zoo with a mopsk. McGrew, they will say, does a wonderful jopsk. He hunts with such vim and he hunts with such vigor, his new zoo, McGrew Zoo, gets bigger and bigger. And, speaking of birds, there's the Russian Paluski, whose head ski is red ski and belly is blue ski. I'll get one of them for my zoo ski, McGrewski. And then the whole town will gasp why this boy never sleeps. No keeper before ever kept what he keeps. There's no telling what that young fellow will do. And then, just to show them, I'll sail to Katru and bring back an it catch, a preep, and a prue, a nurkle, a nerd, and a seersucker, too. I'll hunt in the jungles of Hippo no Hungus and bring back a flock of wild Bippo no Bungus. The Bippo no Bungus from Hippo no Hungus are better than those down in Dippo no Dungus and smarter than those out in Nippo no Nungus. And that's why I'll, I'll catch them in Hippo no Hungus instead of those in Nungus and Dungus. And people will say when they see these bips bounding, this zookeeper, new keepers, simply astounding. He travels so far that you'd think he would drop. When do you suppose this young fellow will stop? should, but I won't stop until I've captured the Fizza Mawiza Madil, the world's biggest bird from the island of Gwark, who only eats pine trees and spits out the bark. And boy, when I get him back home to my park, this whole world will say, young McGrew's made his mark. He's built a zoo better than Noah's whole ark. These wonderful, marvelous beasts that he chooses have made him the greatest of all 
the McGruises. Wow, they all cheer. What this zoo must be worth. It's the gold darndest zoo on the face of the earth. Yes, that's what I do, said young Gerald McGrew. I'd make a few changes if I ran the zoo. Scrambled Egg Super by Dr. Seuss I don't like to brag, and I don't like to boast, said Peter T. Hooper. But speaking of toast, and speaking of kitchens and ketchup and cake, and kettles and stove and the stuff people bake, well, I don't like to brag. But I'm telling you, Liz, that speaking of cooks, I'm the best that there is. Why, only last Tuesday, when Mother was out, I really cooked something worth talking about. You see, I was sitting here resting my legs, and I happened to pick up a couple of eggs. And I sort of got thinking... It's sort of a shame that scrambled eggs always taste always the same. And that's because ever since goodness knows when, they've always been made from the eggs of a hen. Just a plain common hen. What a dumb thing to use with all of the other fine eggs you could choose. And so I decided that just for a change, I'd scramble a new kind of egg on the range. Some fine fancy eggs that no other cook cooks, like the eggs of the ruffle-necked salamagooks. A salamagooks? Say, they should be good. So I went out and found some as quick as I could. And while I was lugging them back to the house, I happened to notice a tizzle-topped grouse in a tree down the street, and I knew from her looks that her egg and the egg of the salamagooks ought to mix mighty well, ought to taste simply super, when scrambled together by Peter T. Hooper. So I took those eggs home and I frizzled them up. And I added some sugar, two-thirds of a cup, and a small pinch of pepper, and also a pound of horseradish sauce that was sitting around, and also some nuts. Then I tasted the stuff, and it tasted quite fine, but not quite fine enough. To make the best scramble that's ever been made, a cook has to hook the best eggs ever laid. So I drove to the country, quite rather far out, and I studied the birds that were flitting about. I looked with great care at a mop-noodled finch. I looked at a beagle-beaked, bald-headed grinch. And also I looked at a shade-roosting quail who was roosting right under a lassalax tail. And I looked at a spritz and a flannel-winged jay. But I just didn't stop. I kept right on my way. Because they didn't have eggs, they weren't laying that day. Then suddenly, boy, up that hill a short space, birds, they were laying all over the place. Great happy gay families with uncles and cousins all laying fine strictly fresh eggs by the dozens. Why'd I have a scramble more super than super? Scrambled eggs, super de duper de booper, special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. I picked out the eggs in a most careful way. I only picked those that I knew were grade A. I only took eggs from the very best fowls, so I didn't take eggs from the twiddler owls, because I knew that the eggs of those fellows who twiddle taste sort of like dust from inside a bass fiddle. I went for the kind that were mellow and sweet. And the world's sweetest eggs are the eggs of the queet, which is due to those very sweet trout which they eat. And those trout? 
Well, they're sweet because they only eat wogs, and wogs, after all, are the world's sweetest frogs. And the reason they're sweet is whenever they lunch, it's always the world's sweetest bees that they munch. And the reason no bees can be sweeter than these they only eat blossoms of bezel nut trees, and these bezel nut blossoms are sweeter than sweet, and that's why I nabbed several eggs from the queet. But I passed up the eggs of a bird called a strudel, who's sort of a stork, but with fur like a poodle, for they say that the eggs of this kind of a stork are gooey like glue, and they stick to your fork. And the yolks of these eggs, I am told, taste like fleece, while the whites taste like very old bicycle grease. The places I hiked to, the roads that I rambled to find the best eggs that have ever been scrambled. I hunted new birds along wild, tangled trails, through gullies and gulches, down dingles and dales. I wriggled my way and I crawled at a creep, through a forest of ferns that was forty miles deep. And I mushed through the brush till I found a fine quigger, whose eggs are as big as a pinhead, no bigger. Then I went for the eggs of a long legger quong. Now this quong, well, she's built just a little bit wrong, for her legs are so terribly, terribly long that she has to lay eggs 20 feet in the air, and they drop with a plop to the ground from up there. So unless you can catch them before the eggs crash, you haven't got eggs, you've got long legger hash. Eggs, I've collected 302, but I needed still more, and I suddenly knew that the job was too big for one fellow to do, so I telegraphed north to some friends near Fazol, which is 10 miles or so just beyond the North Pole, and they all of them jumped in their catamaside, which is sort of a boat made of sea leopard's hide, which they sailed out to sea to go looking for grice, which is sort of a bird which lays eggs on the ice, which they grabbed with a tool which is known as a squiddish, cause those eggs are too cold to be touched without witch. And while they were sending those eggs, I got word of a bird that does something that's almost unheard of. It's hard to believe, but this bird is called the pelf, legs eggs that are three times as big as herself. How that pelf ever learned such a difficult trick, I never found out, but I found that egg quick, and I managed to get it down out of the nest and home to the kitchen along with the rest. But I didn't stop then, cause I knew of some ducks by the name of the single file Zumzimian Zucks, who stroll single file through the mountains of Zums, quite oddly enough, with their eggs on their thumbs. And some fellows in Zums, whom I happened to know, just happened to capture a thousand or so. And they wrapped up their eggs and they mailed them by air, marked special delivery handle with care. I needed more helpers, and so for assistance, I called up a fellow named Ali, long distance, and Ali, as soon as he hung up the phone, picked up a small basket and started alone to climb the steep crags and the jags of Mount Struku to fetch me the egg of a Mount Struku cuckoo. Now these Mount Struku cuckoos are rather small gals, but these Mount Struku 
cuckoos have lots of big pals. They dived from the skies with wild cackling shrieks, and they jabbed at his legs, and they stabbed at his cheeks with their yammering, clamoring, hammering beaks. But Ali, brave Ali, he fought his way through, and he sent me that egg as I knew he would do. For my scrambled eggs, super de duper de booper, special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. In the meanwhile, of course, I was keeping real busy collecting the eggs of the three eyelashed tizzy. They're quite hard to reach, so I rode on the top of a hammocka schnim. Ica schnam ica schnop. Then I found a great flock of southwest facing cranes, and I guess they've got something that's wrong with their brains. For this kind of a crane, when she's guarding her nest, will always stand facing precisely southwest. So to get at those eggs wasn't hard in the least. I came from behind from precisely northeast. And I captured the egg of the grickly Gractus, who lays him up high in a prickly cactus. Then I went for some ziffs. They're exactly like zuffs, but the ziffs live on cliffs and the zuffs live on bluffs. And seeing how bluffs are exactly like cliffs, it's mighty hard telling the zuffs from the ziffs. But I know that the egg that I got from the bluffs, if it wasn't a ziffs from the cliffs, was a zuffs. Now I needed the egg of a moth-watching sneth, who's a bird who's so big she scares people to death. And this awful big bird, well, the reason they name her the moth-watching sneth is because that's how they tame her. She likes watching moths, sort of quiets her mind, and while she is watching, you sneak up behind, and you yank out her egg. So I got one, of course, with the help of some friends and a very fast horse. If you want to get eggs you can't buy at a store, you have to do things never thought of before. Why, to get at the egg of one very small doff, you have to pry all of one mountain top off. Then I heard of some birds who lay eggs, if you please, that taste like the air in the holes in Swiss cheese. And they live in a big Zinzibar Zanzibar trees. So I ordered a trefoil. A job was immense, but I needed those eggs and said, hang the expense. I still needed one more and I saved it for last, the egg of the frightful, bombastic aghast. And that bird is so mean, and that bird is so fast, that I had to escape on a jillica jast, a fleet-footed beast who could run like a deer, but looks sort of different. You steer him by ear. All through with searching, all through with looking, I had all I needed, and now for the cooking. I rushed to the kitchen, the place where I'd stacked them. I rolled up my sleeves, I unpacked them and cracked them, and shucked them and chucked them in 99 pans. Then I mixed in some beans, I used 55 cans. Then I mixed in some ginger, nine prunes and three figs, and parsley, quite sparsely, just 22 sprigs. Then I added six cinnamon sticks and a clove, and my scramble was ready to go on the stove. And you know how they tasted? They tasted just like, well, they tasted exactly, exactly just like, like scrambled eggs, super de duper de booper, special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. On Beyond Zebra by Dr. Seuss. 
said Conrad Cornelius O'Donnell O'Dell, my very young friend who is learning to spell. The A is for ape and the B is for bear, the C is for camel, the H is for hare, the M is for mouse and the R is for rat. I know all the 26 letters like that. Through to Z is for zebra, I know them all well, said Conrad Cornelius O'Donnell O'Dell. So now I know everything anyone knows, from beginning to end, from the start to the close, because Z is as far as the alphabet goes. Then he almost fell flat on his face on the floor when I picked up the chalk and drew one letter more, a letter he never had dreamed of before. And I said, you can stop if you want with a Z, because most people stop with a Z, but not me. In the places I go, there are things that I see that I never could spell if I stopped with a Z. I'm telling you this because you're one of my friends. My alphabet starts where your alphabet ends. My alphabet starts with this letter called Yuz. It's the letter I use to spell Yuzimatuz. You'll be sort of surprised what there is to be found once you go beyond Z and start poking around. So on beyond zebra, explore like Columbus. Discover new letters like Wum is for Wumbus, my high spouting whale who lives high on a hill and who never comes down till it's time to refill. So on beyond Z, it's high time you were shown that you really don't know all there is to be known. Then just step a step further past Wum is for Wumbus and there you'll find Um and the Um is for Umbus. A sort of a cow with one head and one tail, but to milk this great cow, you need more than one pail. She has 98 faucets that give milk quite nicely. Perhaps 99. I forget just precisely. And boy, she is something most people don't see because most people stop at the Z, but not me. I ramble, I scramble through swamp and through swamp where the letters get better like letters like humph. There's a real handy letter. What's handy about it? You just can't spell humph, humph a dumpfer without it. If you stay home with zebra, you're stuck in a rut, but on beyond zebra, you're anything but. Why, I know a fine fancy letter called Fuddle. I use it in spelling Miss Fuddle Dee Duddle. And oh, what a bird of a bird of a bird of. Her tail is the longest that's ever been heard of. So long and so fancy she'd be in a fix if she didn't have helpers. It takes about six to tag along hoisting Miss Fuddle Dee Duddle's wonderful tail out of the Muddle Dee Puddles. And Glick is for Glicker who lives in wild weeds and spends his time juggling fresh cinnamon seeds, which he's usually able to find in great number, excepting of course in the month of September when cinnamon seeds aren't around in great number. So that month he juggles with seeds of cucumber. And na is the letter I use to spell nutches, who live in small caves known as niches for hutches. These nutches have troubles, the biggest of which is the fact there are many more nutches than niches. Each nutch in a niche knows that some other nutch would like to move into his niche very much. So each nutch in a niche has to watch that small niche or nutches who haven't got niches will stitch. Then we go on to Snee, and the Snee is for Sneedle, a terrible kind of ferocious mosquito whose humdinger stinger is sharp as a needle. The Sneedle's too tough to be killed with the smack, so he has to be hunted on elephant back. And your eyes and the elephants have to be keen, and you have to aim fast, and you have to hit clean, and the bullet you shoot is a stale navy bean that you've dunked for three weeks in old sour kerosene, which is awful hard work, so it's easy to see why most people stop at the Z but not me. When you go beyond zebra, who knows? There's no telling what wonderful things you might find yourself spelling. Like Quan is for Quandry who lives on a shelf in a hole in the ocean alone by himself. And he worries each day from the dawn's early light. And he worries, just worries far into the night. He just stands there and worries. He simply can't stop. Is his top side his bottom or bottom side top? And Thnad is for Thnanders, and oh, are they sad, oh. The big one you see has the smaller one, Shadow. The shadow that small Thnander has should be his. I don't understand it, but that's how it is. A terrible mix-up in shadows, gee whiz. And Spaz is a letter I use to spell spasm, a beast who belongs to the Nazim of Basm. Handy for traveling, that's why he has them. More easy to pack than a suitcase or grip, those horns carry all that he needs on a trip. 
a thread and a needle for mending his socks, his toothbrush, a cup, and two three-handed clocks, and his velvet umbrella, his vegetable chopper, and also his gold-plated popping corn popper and a grasshopper cage for his favorite grasshopper. And Flube is for Flube Boober Bab Boober Bubs, who bounce in the water like blubbery tubs. They're no good to eat. You can't cook them like steaks, but they're handy in crossing small oceans and lakes. And Zats is the letter I use to spell Zats it, whose nose is so high that most nobody pats it. And patting his lonely old nose is the least that a fellow could do for this fine friendly beast. So to get there and do it, I built an invention. The three-seater Zatsit nose padding extension. If you try to drive one, you'll certainly see why most people stop at the Z, but not me. And jog is my letter for spelling jogoons who doodle around in the far desert dunes. Just doodle around crooning very sad tunes about peppermint, peanuts, and pebbles and prunes and paint pots and polka dots, pinheads and pigs and their grandmother's grandfather's stepsister's wigs. So you see, there's no end to the things you might know depending how far beyond zebra you go. I have a letter called Flun, and the Flun is for Flunnel, a softest nice fellow who hides in a tunnel. He only comes out of his hole, I'm afraid, when the right kind of softish nice music is played, on a kind of hunting horn called the O'Grunth, and to learn how to play it takes month after month of practicing, practicing, isn't much fun. And besides, it's quite heavy, weighs almost a tonth. That's why few people bother to play the O'Grunth. So the flunnel's been out of his tunnel just once. And way, way past Z is a letter called itch. And the itch is for itchipods, animals which race around back and forth, forth and back, through the air, on a very high sidewalk between here and there. They're afraid to stay there. They're afraid to stay here. They think there is too far. They think here is too near. And since here is too near and out there is too far, they are too scared to roost wheresoever they are. There's a letter called Yek, and the Yek is for Yekko, who howls in an underground grotto in Gecko. Those Yekkos love echoes, and this is their motto. For best Yekko echoes, try Gecko or Grotto. Oh, the things you can find if you don't stay behind. On a world near the sun live two brothers called Vrooms, who strangely enough are built sort of like brooms. And they're stuck all alone up there high in the blue. And so, to kill time, just for something to do, each one of these fellows take turns with the other in sweeping the dust off his world with his brother. And hi is my letter for high gargle or orum, for getting me places real fast, I'm all for em. They puffle along and their brakes never squeak, and they run every hour, every day of the week, from the town of North Nub to the town of East Ounce, making stops at West Bunkfield, Yupster, and Jounce, and at Ipswich and Nipswich and also South Bounce, and another small town that's too hard to pronounce. The places I took him. I tried hard to tell young Conrad Cornelius O'Donnell O'Dell a few brand new wonderful words he might spell. I led him around and I tried hard to show there are things beyond Z that most people don't know. I took him past Zebra as far as I could and I think perhaps maybe I did him some good. Because finally he said, this is really great stuff and I guess the old alphabet isn't enough. Now the letters he uses are something to see. Most people stop at the Z, but not he. The end. The Cat's Quizzer. Are you smarter than the cat in the hat? Here is Ziggy Zovoze, Vozozel, with his sister Zizzy. They got 100%. They got Every question wrong. Are you smarter than Zovozel? Which end of the bee stings you? Do elephants have uncles? Which grows faster, an uncle's eyebrows or an uncle's mustache? Are there a few ducks on the moon? Are freckles Catching? Where do peanut trees grow? China, Japan, USA, 
Where else? Uh, those are too easy. On we go to something harder. Now, look at this picture. Look at it hard. Then, turn the page. Quiz about the page before. How many wheels on the cat's wagon? Was there a flag on the house? Was the cat holding his umbrella? Did the big yellow animal have blue dots? <clears throat> if you owned the big yellow animal, what would you call it? How are you doing? So far, are you smarter than a uh, Zolfozel? How old do you have to be to be a Boy Scout? To be a Girl Scout? To drive a car? To fry an egg? To vote for president? To be the president? And how old do you have to be to be a Japanese? How long can you play stare eyes without blinking? How long can you play stare eyes without laughing? Which can go higher? A bee? An eagle? A balloon? Or someone with a helicopter cap? True or false? Only redheads can wiggle their ears. A camel never drinks water on Thursdays. A cat is always shorter than his shadow. Your shadow is always longer than you are. There are more donut holes in the world than donuts. Who will go higher? Joe or Mo? A night quizzer. Do horses sleep standing up? Do roosters sleep on their backs or on their sides? Do fish sleep with one eye open? There are flashlights for when it's dark. Are there flash darks for when it's light? Which turtle will get to the pizza palace first? Lava comes out of what? What comes out of what? What comes out of a tree? Who comes out of a what? What is it that comes out of a what is it? Tongue quizzer. How fast can you say? Ellie's elegant elephant. 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 Food quiz. Do Japanese eat with pogo sticks or joss sticks? Does spaghetti grow on land or underwater? What do Italians call macaroni? Do pineapples grow on pine trees or apple trees? Tell me three things you had for dinner last night.
And can you do this easy trick? Who will win, the X's or the O's? Which walks farther, his front feet or his hind feet? Would you rather have more questions or would you rather have the mumps? Me, I'd rather have the mumps. Are there many w women kings? Are there any women uncles? And if a dinosaur walked into your backyard, what is the first thing you would do? True or false? For sale. In Ireland, you can buy rainbows. That is Zizi Zoz. Zofuzel. Snails are faster than turtles. It is not safe to ride backwards on an ostrich. What would you do if you sprouted a daisy? Would you run and see your dentist? Would you water it and grow more of them? Would you sell them to your friends? Or would you try to grow some roses? They're worth a lot more. Which goes further, a ping pong ball or a bow? What do they call one-eyed eyeglasses? What do they call a one-wheeled bicycle? What do they call a one-horned animal? What would you do if you jumped in the air and didn't come down? This could happen, you know, so you'd better have an answer. Here are four what. Are you upside down in a spoon? What is your zip code? This wheel goes this way. That makes this wheel go this way. Please tell me, am I going forwards or backwards? It's getting harder and I'm getting tired. Everyone's tired, but we must go on. And there are more A's or Z's in the alphabet. Where do crows hide soccer balls? Which is the best weather vane? What was George Washington's favorite TV program? Do worms dream? Does Joe look closer to Mo than Mo looks to Joe? Who will get the banana? Who will get the most bananas? What was Abraham Lincoln's middle name? Who will lose the X's or the O's? Does your family have a one or two car garage? Where would you go to learn to play the stethoscope? Which is taller, a tall pygmy or a short giant? In Yosemite Park, do the bears take photographs? Are you older than your teeth? Oh, I'm so tired of the whole silly thing. You started it, you get it up and finish it. Here are more than 100 things that begin with H. The Zolfuzels could only find six. So, how about it? Are you smarter than a Zolfuzel? The answers, yay.